All right, well, good morning. It is time to get started. Uh, lots of ground to cover as always. So before we dive into the word, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, acknowledge the presence of our master in this place, and remember those uh, of our church family, both here and online, that are dealing with uh, different sicknesses or uh, maybe even this, uh, this COVID thing. Let's lift them up in prayer. Father, we just acknowledge you. We thank you for your goodness in this place. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to be able to discuss your word without fear of repercussions, without fear of uh, uh, persecution, because we know that times will come when persecution will be there for those who want to discuss your word, for those who want to follow hard after you. So we thank you for our enduring freedom, God, and we pledge to continue to fight for it, but we thank you for it this morning. God, for those who are out, for those we know who are dealing with this pesky and, and uh, horrible virus, we speak against it in the name of Jesus Christ. We speak to the last clinging symptoms of, of families we know that are on the tail end of this thing. We command fatigue to go. We command the, the lack of sense of smell and, and taste to be eradicated, for their senses to be restored to the way that you intended it to function. Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name for you to minister healing throughout this body and to, to anyone that is, that is dealing with this within the sound of my voice, listening to it now or, or later on. We just speak your healing into their situation so all they have to do is claim it based on your goodness and your promises. In Jesus' name, the people of God said, amen. Well, we are jumping back into our series in Revelation. We took uh, the week off last week and tackled some things uh, from a pr prophetic perspective that I had not yet covered. Uh, some of that instigated uh, by uh, some questions uh, from uh, some of the teens here in the group, and I wanted to make sure that I answered those questions and got that to people. So if we can get the slide presentation up, we got that, we're good to go. Here is the, uh, the homework that we kind of left you with the last time we were here. We had reminded you to go back and look at Daniel 9 um, to, to outline the 70 weeks, to really be familiar with that portion of Scripture. It's a good place to keep yourself uh, grounded and understand prophecy, and we provided you a couple of sessions on that. So, so do that. Make sure that you know how to explain that portion of prophetic Scripture to somebody else. And then, of course, we are in Revelation chapter 6 for the duration of this session, uh, and then we'll be moving into Revelation chapter 7. Uh, so we're going to be dealing with the opening of the sealed scroll. This is our second session in this chapter. <clears throat> and I want to conduct just a little bit of review because it's been uh, a little bit since we were in this series. Uh, we're in a section of Revelation called What Happens After These Things, which is really chapter through the end of the book because the, that portion of scripture begins with the words metatauta in Greek or after these things. So the book is divided in a convenient outline in Revelation 1 verse 19 where Jesus tells John, write the things which you have seen. That's the vision of the risen Christ in chapter 1. And the things which are the seven churches, chapters 2 through 3. And the things which shall be hereafter, that which follows after the churches, chapters 4 through 22. But Revelation 6 through 22 is really the unfolding of the seven-sealed scroll that Jesus receives in Revelation chapter 5. We've described that as a ketubah or as a wedding uh, contract that Jesus as the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, is opening. And then we see the judgments upon the world being poured out. And that's the other aspect of Jesus as the Goel, the avenger of blood, taking action on behalf of those that were wronged. And really, it is the opening part of what we might call uh, the Great Tribulation. Now, that said, however... I remind you that we have been looking at a group of signs. These same signs are mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we see them here in Revelation chapter 6, which begins with false Christs, wars, famines, and death. 
Uh, those would be the first, and then we'll be looking specifically at martyrs and global chaos in this session. Now, interestingly enough, in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew 24, Luke 13, uh, or I'm sorry, Mark 13 and Luke 21, Jesus describes these things as kind of non-signs, meaning these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In fact, Jesus says that in Matthew 24, verse 6, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is the beginning of sorrows. And uh, other translations render that phrase, beginning of sorrows, a bit differently. Um, and I had a, uh, the way other translations render it is as birth pangs. Birth pangs, same, same in the Greek, it really can be rendered either way. Birth pangs is a, is a key way to look at this, though, because it is something that means when they begin, they start to increase in both intensity and in frequency until the deliverance occurs. Does that make sense? Okay, so when we're talking about this group of signs that up until now we've really referenced as the beginning of sorrows, the fact that other translators have rendered it birth pangs, it's because it is the beginning, the dawning of a new age. A lot of people look at Revelation as the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It may be the end of this present dispensation, but it's really the birthing of the next chapter. That's really what we're looking at as it reveals Jesus Christ. And as you will notice, these first seals that we see, the, the seven seals of Revelation 5 that are being opened in Revelation 6, they correspond to the beginning of sorrows. They have deception, wars, famine, and death, martyrs, and global cosmic changes. That's the first six seals. Uh, so we could really say that the beginning of sorrows actually takes place during Revelation chapter 6. Now, that doesn't mean that prior to this, we've never seen wars or rumors of wars. It doesn't mean that we haven't seen famines. It, it, the beginning of sorrows really could begin, but because they're birth pangs, what we're seeing at the opening of the scrolls is the intensifying of, of uh, the birth pangs, is the intensifying of the frequency. We're seeing it come together at a whole new level. And just as a reminder, without going too far, you'll have, to, you'll have to look back. Those first four signs are often referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that's what we looked at in our previous session in this series. We looked at it from the standpoint of the first seal being the great deception. And that's the rider on the white horse. We correctly identified him with the Antichrist, where some commentators choose to identify him with Christ. No, it is not Christ. Uh, that Christ would be keeping bad company if this were that guy. And his descriptors are all wrong. Uh, and then we took a look at the second seal, which is conflict on the earth, the rider on the red horse, war. Uh, and then we looked at the fourth seal, seal, or I'm sorry, the third seal, which was the rider on the black horse, famine and scarcity on the earth. And then finally, we looked at the fourth seal, the rider on what is called the pale, the livid horse, uh, the rider known as death. And in all reality, he actually brings with him another passenger. It says death and Hades is in his toe or Hades is, is in his, is being led by him. And one of the things we found about him is he's really pestilence because the word translated pale or livid in the Greek is actually chloros, and it's the word from which we get chlorine. In Leviticus, it's the color of leprosy. Disease is implied in this horse. That's really where we, where we took off. Now, one other thing that I kind of want to remind you of is we're taking things a little bit differently as we jump in to this to this unfolding. What I have on the screen for you right now is really what, um, what they might call the traditional order of events that people of our ilk 
doctrinally, pre-tribulational, pre-millennialists or dispensationalists would see. We see the harpazo. Remember, that's just the Greek word for the rapture because rapture comes from a Latin word. In, in Greek, it's harpazo. We are taken out of here at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, the whole area in red on your screen. Daniel's 70th week is to have 3.5 years of a false peace. In the middle of it, the Antichrist directs an abomination of desolation in the temple. And then 3.5 years of what is really the Great Tribulation, the, the wrath being poured out in the last half of Daniel's 70th week. And while we are in heaven, we experience the Bema Seat Judgment and then the seven-year period that is known as the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And then ultimately, at the end of that second week, the second coming of Christ returning to the earth, Satan being bound. But what I sent you home with um, the last time we were there is we actually asked the question, does, does the rapture have to immediately trigger the seven-year tribulation? And in reality, there is some evidence that there could be a gap of 10 to maybe even 30 years that take place between the rapture and the rise of the Antichrist to power. And if, if you look at it that way, these first six seals up to and maybe including the seventh, the first six though, they really fit the beginning of sorrows fitting into that gap period. The Antichrist kind of showing up on the scene, rising to power, wars that allow him to accumulate power, famine taking place because of all of the craziness that is going on, and then, and then death through diseases and, and chaos reigning, and then martyrs as persecution begins to reign, and then, and then global chaos. And then you could see where a peace contract kind of gets employed and people are willing to follow a one world government. And so it's not necessary that you look at it this way. We're just saying that it's possible. And as we continue to move forward, we're going to continue to suggest things. And the reason that we do that is if we've learned anything in our study of Christ, if we've learned anything in our study of the word, one of the things that we truly have come to appreciate is the more precision we treat the Bible with, the more we are rewarded with deep meaning from Scripture. So yes, all pre-tribulational rapturists, they treat the Bible with a literal interpret uh, interpretation. I have found a few places where I think some commentators lean toward even more precision, and uh, I'm inclined to go that way, and I'm going to continue to suggest some of that stuff even in this session this morning, not because I think it's absolutely doctrinally necessary, but I think it might be worth further investigations. It could turn up more things that are more insightful than perhaps commentators that have come before have turned up because they lean towards generalities. And, and so that's why I'm doing that. I'm not trying to be doctrinally um, dogmatic about it. But again, what we are going to see as we move forward in this section is that there are a series of six, such as the seven sealed scroll and the six seals. Then there is a parenthesis, which is going to be chapter seven. It just pauses. We don't get to the seventh seal into the beginning of chapter eight. And each one of those opens up the next seven judgments. We have the seven trumpet judgments that take place then and then there is a parenthesis that takes place in there before we get to the seventh and the seventh triggers the seven bowl judgments and even in the seventh bowl judgments there's a little one verse parenthesis that takes place before you get to the seventh bowl so that's kind of a cascading judgment effect that takes place throughout the rest of the book of uh, revelation until we get to about revelation 19 so that's the structure that we're in so with that as a little bit of review taking place for us, I want to jump in to discussing this fifth seal. Let's jump into the fifth and sixth seals. And I kind of left you here with a little other homework to review the Jewish wedding model, to review evidences for the gap between the rapture and the great tribulation worksheet that we handed out. It's linked to in the comments for this session. Um, to read Revelation 6, 9 through 17, because that's where we're going. And I asked the question, of the temple furnishings, what altar are the martyrs of the fifth seal under? We'll find that, find that out in a second. Where in this temple was the altar located? And then also... 
uh, to read Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Where is the bride in this parable? Why are the guests judged whether or not they are worthy? So that's how we're going to kind of spend the first part of this session, and then we'll take a look at, at the last, uh, last seal as well. So let's talk about this fifth seal, the cry of the martyrs. <clears throat> Persecution is what this is evocative of. So when we began our tour of the heavenly temple back in Revelation chapter 4, we kind of found ourselves on the most inner portion of the temple in the heavenly courts because we were where the throne was, which means with it, God's throne is on the mercy seat. The mercy seat is on the ark. The ark is in the holy of holies. And then, of course, we see the candle stands there, so we're also seeing the holy place. So we're in the inner precincts of the temple in heaven in that vision. But now... What you're going to see is we're actually proceeding out a step to the outer courts of the temple to where the brazen altar in the outer courts sits and we start to see a startling display. So I'm just trying to ground you that we're in the same vision, we're in the same place, but instead of seeing the stuff that was previous to this being poured out on the earth with the last four signs that we saw, the riders that were going forth, we're now back in the heavenly court, but we're just zooming out a bit to see more of the picture than we've seen so far in Revelation 4 and 5. Does that help kind of give you a, a grounding? So remember also this as we move forward. We've got the two parties that are taking place before John, uh, two, two groups. You've got the four living creatures that are in heaven, and you've got the 24 elders that are in heaven. And every time something happens in heaven and John asks a question, it's the 24 elders that give him an answer. Every time something happens on the earth that causes John to ask a question, it's the four living creatures that give him an answer. So as you're going through the book from this point all the way to the end of the book, you can get your bearings. Is this something that's taking place in the heavenly realm or is this something that's taking place back on earth by simply looking at who's answering John's question? Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Okay. <clears throat> so jumping back into the text itself, Revelation 6, 9 through 10, it says, when he opened the fifth seal, he being Jesus, right? He's the only one authorized to open the seals. He said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So these fifth seal saints, they are asking, How long? Now, since we saw the church in heaven, and there's scholars that disagree with this, but because we saw the emblems of the church in heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the, the lampstands go from being on the earth to being in heaven, and the 24 elders are called kings and priests, so there's only three groups of people in the Bible called kings and priests. One is Melchizedek, the next is Jesus, who is a priest, hold on, If you haven't sneezed in front of tons of people online, then you just haven't lived. <laughs> um, so Jesus is a priest of the order of Melchizedek, according to uh, Hebrews. And then the church is called by Christ kings and priests and called by Paul kings and priests. So we know the 24 elders are of the church. So these fifth seal saints are on the, uh, on the earth and they're, they're, they're dead. We're now in heaven. And they're crying out, how long? And this is interesting because they're listed before the tribulation saints that we are going to see in Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 15. This is a different group of saints. So after the rapture, as persecution ramps up, it appears the Revelation 6 martyrs may come to faith during this period preceding the seven-year tribulation. It could be these are people who get saved during that gap that we are proposing 
takes place here. And because they, they are persecuted. The reason I say they may get saved during this gap is because they are crying out how long, which offers evidence that they don't know that they are yet in the great tribulation. In our two, two sessions that we did on the fig tree generation last week, we offered evidence that pe people on earth will know they are in the tribulation because Jesus says in Matthew 24, the generation that sees all of these things, which we'll look at again in a minute, but there's a series of signs that tell you you're in the great tribulation. If you've seen one of them happen, you've got a clock. You know how long. You don't have to ask how long. But these saints don't seem to have that clock ticking. They're asking how long until we're avenged. Otherwise, they would know they're in the final seven-year period or in the final three-and-a-half-year period, and they would be waiting. Now, it says these saints are under the altar. And that word here, sorry, I didn't change the subtitle on the slide, but under or beneath, that word here, uh, hippocato means at the base of. So it's not like they're buried under the altar. Okay, the altar in this, um, in this place is the brazen altar in the outer courts of the temple. It is where all of the slaughtering of the lambs took place. The, the Gentiles could stand in the court of Gentiles and watch what was going on in this place. And it was... 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 10 cubits. So if you want a cubit, a cubit is from the tip of your middle finger to the point of your elbow, typically about 18 inches, okay? Uh, could be, could be wat longer than that. Um, multiply that by 20 and, and then take that number by itself, and that's how the big the base of it was. And then multiply that number by 10, 180, and, 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 and then divide that by 12, and you get feet. It was a big altar, it was large. It wasn't some tiny little altar. It was an altar where priests congregated and they did the work of, of the, uh, uh, the, depth, uh, the sacrificing there. And we'll see an image of that in a second. So then we have this phrase mart, uh, martyria in the Greek, which is from the root martis. And what that really means is a witness, like a legal historical witness, a spectator of anything. And it, it's where we get the, the, the term martyr comes from the Greek, people who died for their witness of Christ. Those who, after his example, have proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. So again, here's this brazen altar. It's much bigger than people realize. And so at the base of the altar means they're probably standing at the base of that platform in the heavenly temple, crying out to God. Uh, and you can see the dimensions for it in 1 Kings chapter 8, 2 Kings 14, 2 Chronicles uh, 4, etc. So to make this point a little more clearly, please understand that these aren't some mystical, see-through beings. These are souls, okay? They're people who have perished. They're in the heavenly vision, but they haven't received their glorified bodies yet. Now, the raptured saints, however, we're told that in an instant, we're changed. We're told the dead in Christ rise first, and the rest of us meet him in the air, and in the twinkling of an eye, we are made like him. But for whatever reason, these souls, they are waiting at the altar. They have not received their perfected bodies yet. That's the indication that the text would seem to give us. So... And that's something that we'll talk about more in a future session as well because people often have confusion. What is the rapture? What is the first resurrection? What is the second resurrection? And which groups do those pertain to? And we'll bring some clarity to that later on. So why are they martyred? Well, the scripture says they're martyred for the word of God and their testimony. And word of God is synonymous with Jesus. When are they martyred? As we saw, how long suggests they do not know the time before judgment or the second coming comes. And what are they waiting for? They're crying out, thy kingdom come. It echoes their petition. So at this point, regardless of what you believe about the rapture, one thing we know to be true, Christ has not returned yet. 
the second coming has definitively not happened. <clears throat> so, with that said, let's move a little bit further to Revelation 6.11. It says, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. So we're told that others will join them. And we see this in places in Revelation, like chapter 11, verse 7, uh, 14, verse 13, 20, verses 4 through 5. It is not personal revenge that they're crying out for, but vindication of God's holiness and the establishment of God's justice. Intolerance by the ungodly is increasing, especially among so-called liberals, and we can see that in the persecution that takes place here. Now, what I'd like to flip back to is Christ in his parable of the wedding feast. And I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps there's more than meets the eye in Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Um, as Jesus drew nearer to the cross his message became more and more directed to the representatives of the Jewish nation. In Matthew 22, he deals with the three main groups, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. The Herodians were political activists who supported the rule of Herod, even though he was an illegitimate Jew. The Pharisees were usually against them, ardently supporting Israel against the rule of Rome. And the Sadducees were a group of liberal theologians that didn't believe in the miraculous. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And the three parties all hated each other. But near the end of the Gospels, they all come together because they hate something else more. They hate Jesus more. Hate is a unifying factor when it comes to the enemies of God. <clears throat> So Jesus included them all in the parable of the wedding feast, which is the third in a series of parables if you look at it from Luke's account, Luke 14. So Jesus declared that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to the incident in which a king made a marriage feast for his son. His slaves were sent out to invite the guests, but the guests were not willing to come. The king sent them out a second time, reminding them that the feast was ready. But the guests were unconcerned and went about their business as if they had not received the invitation. And some of them actually treated the servants roughly, even killed some, killing the prophets perhaps. When the tidings of this reached the king, he sent forth his soldiers, destroyed the murderers, and burned their sitting. But the wedding was still without guests, so he commanded his servants to invite anyone they could. And being invited, many came. As the wedding feast was progressing, however, the king saw one of the guests without a wedding garment. These garments were supplied by the host at a Jewish wedding, and the guest was not wearing the garment, which was a violation of the normal custom. When confronted with his lack of wedding garment, the guest was speechless. The king then gave orders to bind him hand and foot and cast him out. Then Jesus added the comment, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So throughout the course of this, we see three distinct invitations take place. The first was Jesus' preaching ministry constituted an invitation for the hearers to come. The second referred to the further invitation of the nation, which they would reject and would result in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The third movement referred to the gospel age where all are bidden to come regardless of race or background. And so the lessons of the parable, traditionally speaking, are pretty clear. Some would say that the first invitation was the prophets, the second invitation was Jesus speaking, and the third was the gospel. That's how this parable is typically interpreted. And I want to say there is nothing wrong with that interpretation. I am not criticizing it. What I would like to do, however, is look at this one more time, go through the text with the Jewish wedding model, and what we've learned from it in our mind, and what we just learned from Revelation chapter 6. I haven't seen anybody else 
and I've tried to find um, different people that, that, that may back me up on this, but I started to see something as I was studying, and um, I, I just want to share it. But first, let's go to 1 John 1.11, <clears throat> which says, He came to his own, his own things or domain, and his own people, they did not receive him. Let's take a look at this. Matthew 22. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. I want to ask you the question. When we saw the Jewish wedding model, we saw that typically the servant, we see this in Genesis with Abraham finding a son for Isaac, a servant is sent out to identify a bride and ask her to return. Here, we notice that it's servants, plural. That servants are being sent out to this group. Not necessarily one. Typically, the Holy Spirit plays the role of the unnamed servant in the wedding metaphor. He later then becomes the gift or the mohair that is provided to the bride as the betrothal gift. And that's never taken away from her. Okay? But here we see that it's servants. It doesn't quite fit the Holy Spirit metaphor. Matthew 22, 4 says, Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. So in the traditional interpretation of this text, the guests and the bride are treated as one group. The guests are going to wear white raiment. The bride wears white raiment. It's all speaking of the church. That's how this is traditionally interpreted. My question for you is knowing what we've learned about the Jewish wedding model is where is the bride when the guests are invited to the dinner party? Her groom has already gone and got her in the dark of the night. And she is with him under the hoopah, waiting to consummate the marriage so that the marriage supper can begin because it does not begin until the guests have arrived. See what I'm saying? In other words, the bride is already there. She's taking place. And these guests are not part of the bride. And this is what I was saying to you earlier that and, and there is there is some scholars that lean toward precision, and there's other scholars that say, well, you know what that does is it ignores the fluidity of metaphorical language. In certain parables, Jesus is the lamb. In other parables, Jesus is the shepherd. But if we've learned anything precision, there's things to be gleaned from precision. This could be a call to come be a guest at the wedding. But see, certain people commentators, they fail to make distinctions between different groups of saints within the body of Christ. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Moses, Joseph, David, they are all called saints in the Old Testament, but they are not part of the church. There are those who, people, I have heard speakers say, well, the Holy Spirit can't be the restrainer that is, that is holding back the lawless one in Thessalonians because God wouldn't remove the, Thess the, the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has to be there for people to get saved in the tribulation. The Holy Spirit wasn't promised to every group of saints like he was promised to the church. The Holy Spirit was active, involved in the Old Testament. He came upon people in the Old Testament, but he didn't dwell inside people in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit dwells inside and empowers the church. And the Holy Spirit can still be on the earth because he's hovered over the earth since Genesis chapter 1. But he won't indwell people after the church is removed. Because remember, it is a masculine noun, he, the restrainer. Don't confuse the church with the restrainer because the church is referred to in the feminine. Okay? Grammar matters. So the question becomes, who are these servants and where is the bride? 
Moving on, it says, but they made light of it and went their, their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. <clears throat> the traditional interpretation is perfectly fine. But this does also speak to a possible yet future judgment where the king judges cities and invites people to come because then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Jesus is the only thing that makes the church worthy, but these guests seems to have to make a choice. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. Oh, that's weird. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Speechless can be taken for did not have the testimony of Christ. As the saints in Revelation 6 and the saints in Revelation 7, etc. They are killed for the word of their testimony. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of, and of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. If this is in fact, a more precise interpretation of the text. Again, nothing wrong with the traditional interpretation of the text. But if this is, then this calls some, causes some great problems for Calvinists who try to base unconditional election on the verse, many are called, but few are chosen. Because these servants definitely had some conditions they had to meet to be found worthy. Does that make sense? So again, I'm not trying to make dogma there. I'm just trying to tell you, if you remember Hebrew prophecy, Hebrew prophecy has a model in which there are four levels of interpretation. Peshat, Remez, Darash, Sod. There can be more than meets the eye. I'm not going to be dogmatic about how we look at that. Just something that is for your edification. Think about it. Pray about it. Search it out a little bit. Re Revelation 19.9a says, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God is looking for guests to be there. We know if they are martyred during the tribulation, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ, even if they have not been resurrected yet. This may suggest to us that these souls get an immediate seat at the bare minimum at the strange cousin's table at the wedding where I sat at every wedding in my 20s. All right. One commentator, in fact, says, the unfounded notion that God treats all saints of all ages exactly alike is hard to displace in the theology of the church. The fact that the divine purpose is not the same for Israel, the Gentile believers, or the church of the present age is plainly written in the word of God. So that's some food for thought on the fifth seal. Let's talk for a moment about the sixth seal, cosmic disturbances. This is where one could say the poopy hits the fan. Now, remember, we've asked the question, when does the clock start? And I've given you this group, this, 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 this specific layout, a little bit non-traditional, because we do slide in that gap where the beginning of sorrow starts. I want to just put that back into your mind mentally there. Focus on the image, and we're going to jump into Revelation 6, 12 and following. It says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Everybody say, the moon became like blood. Remember that. 
And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Let's talk for a minute about earthquakes. The earth becomes environmentally unfriendly. This is the first of three earthquakes talked about in the book of Revelation. Here in Revelation 6, another in Revelation 11 and a third in Revelation 16, just as a way to get some bearings. These are literal earthquakes. Many commentators, especially those who like to allegorize the book of Revelation, try to say this is a shaking of kingdoms, or this is a shaking of, of the political status quo, or this is, this is the upturning of this government or that government. They try to turn it into a metaphor. There is no reason we should believe this to be a metaphorical earthquake because Exodus 1918, 2018 through 19, 1 Kings 1911, Matthew 27, 51 through 52, they deal with seismos, an actual shaking. And in fact, there at the bottom of your screen on that slide, I deal with a whole bunch of scriptures that are talking about actual shaking with the possible exception of Hebrews chapter 12, but even then, it could be referencing a shaking at the end times. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That may need to be interpreted more literally than we typically do. Let's look at a few. Isaiah 24.1 says, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. Matthew 24, verses 29 through 30 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Everybody say, the moon will not give its light. Remember that. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. Notice that this specific set of signs says immediately after the tribulation. If our theory is right, the sixth seal could be taking place during or just before the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Well, that would mean we're talking about two separate sets of cosmic disturbances. I wonder if I can prove that from the text. Again, we're talking about breaking from tradition and potentially seeking better answers through treating the text with a little more precision. Revelation 6.14 says, Then the sky receded as a scroll, when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. People have a tendency to take prophetic portions of scripture that use this type of language and assume that it has to be allegorical because nothing like this has ever happened. In other words, they assume what evolutionists assume, uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. Things have always been the way they are now, and we know that that's how they were back then. We don't see this type of cosmic upheaval. But the Bible is predicting strange events. In fact, one so could go so far as to say that the solar system becomes a bad neighborhood. The sun is said to become a sackcloth in places like Isaiah 13.10 and Joel 2.10. The moon becomes like blood in Isaiah 13, 10, 24, 23, Joel 2, 51, and wait a minute, Matthew, Matthew said the moon will not give its light. That's, that's different than becoming like blood, right? A blood moon is still a red moon. You can still see it. The sky and the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, Isaiah 34, 1 through 8. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places, Jeremiah 4, 23 through 24, and Revelation 16, 20. Is this more than metaphor? What are we to make of phrases like the fabric of space? The Bible is full of references to stretching the heavens. Job 9, 8 says, He who alone stretches the heavens. Psalms 104, 2, stretching out the heavens like a tent curtain. 
Isaiah 40, 22, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Jeremiah 10, 12, he has stretched out the heavens. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, Zechariah 12, 1, are all of these simply metaphors. If space can be rolled up, there is some dimension in which space must be thin by some definition. It can't be infinitely wide. If space can be bent, then there must be a direction that space can be bent towards. Thus, the Bible seems to imply that there are additional spatial dimensions beyond length, height, width, and time. Physicists currently postulate that there are as many as 10. Space is not an empty vacuum. The Bible says it can be torn in Isaiah, worn out like a garment in the Psalms, shaken in Hebrews and Haggai, burnt up in 2 Peter, split apart like a scroll in Revelation, rolled up like a mantle in Hebrews 1 or Isaiah 34. And there are no fewer than 17 other references to the heavens being stretched. So what I want to do is remind you that once upon a time, scientists have calculated that our solar system was not nearly as friendly a place as it is today. That there are over 1,800 years where catastrophic events took place on our planet. And I lay out for you seven great catastrophes. Why did so many of the early cultures worship the planet Mars? They were tired, terrified of this strange planet. It was called the God of War. In fact, the term martial arts is still used to this day, and that's where it comes from. There are other mysteries associated with this strange planet. All early calendars, including the Assyrians, Chaldeans, Egyptians, Hebrew, Persians, Greeks, Phoenicians, Chinese, Mayans, Hindus, Carthaginians, Etruscans, and Teutons, all had 360-day calendars, typically with a 30-day, uh, 12, 30-day months. In ancient Chaldea, the calendar was based on a 360-day year, and that is where we get the tradition of 360 degrees in a circle, 60 minutes to an hour, 60 seconds to each minute because of these ancient calendars that people just assume had no basis in reality. In fact, as we saw with the correct interpretation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the biblical year is 360 days. <clears throat> and it is so remarkable that it has led certain scientists to believe thanks to a principle called orbital resonance, that once upon a time, the planets Mars and the planet Earth were in a two-to-one resonant orbit. In other words, Earth had an orbit of 360 days to match all the calendars that existed back then. The people weren't stupid. They knew how long their years were. And Mars had an orbit of 720 days. Now, when you're in a two-to-one resonant orbit like that, every now and then, on a pattern of 54 years or 108 years, they've worked it out, Mars and Earth would have come dangerously close to each other. Everybody here knows that it's our moon that controls the tides, right? The moon goes up and down. Can you imagine an object as large as the planet Mars racing past our planet? What happens if you have a bed of iron filings on the ground and you swing a pendulum in the shape of a sphere over that bed of iron filings. What happens? They all lift up, right? They've laid out the mountain ranges that are on our planet, and they seem to be like a giant spheroid magnet just came down and swiped across the planet and caused mountains to uplift. It's called crustal tides. Not ocean tides, crustal tides. Tides in the Earth's crust raising and lowering. Okay? Okay? It causes mountains to be created in minutes, not in millennia, like those who believe in long geological ages require. And interestingly enough, the Bible predicts this pattern starting circa 2500 BC with the Noatian flood, 
930 B.C., the Tower of Babel. 1877 B.C., Sodom and Gomorrah. 1447, excuse me, B.C., the Exodus Catastrophe. The Long Day of Joshua. The Greater Davidic Catastrophe. The Joel Amos Catastrophe. And ending with the Isaiah Catastrophe in 701 B.C., at which point it seems that Earth picked up five days in its orbit, five and one quarter days, and Mars lost time, bringing them into non-resident orbits where they no longer come into cataclysmic proximity to one another. And interestingly enough, the Bible and every other calendar on the planet in the time of King Hezekiah, the sundial of Ahaz, had to change their calendars. The Jews do it by adding a leap month on a sequence of every 19 years. The first king of the city of Rome had to do it. And every other culture since had to adjust the calendars from the ancient 360-day year to the modern 365 and a quarter day year. Why? Because the earth and Mars, the solar system itself, used to be a bad neighborhood. But we have existed for thousands of years. People think pagan people from ancient cultures are stupid. We don't take what they tell us seriously. We don't respect the history they've passed down to us. And because of that, even modern Christian commentators today say all that stuff that talks about the universe becoming a bad location, a bad piece of real estate, our solar system, it must be metaphorical. I submit to you, what if we have been on a clock this entire time of peaceful rotations? And when God says time is finally over, the catastrophes return. Jonathan Swift comes to the rescue. You may not believe this, but this remarkable conjecture that Mars made passbys near Earth would seem to be corroborated by Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels. In his third voyage, Gulliver visits the land of Laputa, where the astronomers brag that they know about the two moons of Mars. Their highly detailed description includes their size, the rotation, the revolutions of each of the two moons. And what makes this particular illusion so provocative is that the two moons of, moons of Mars were not discovered by astronomers until 151 years after Gulliver's travel was written because telescopes to view the two satellites of Mars didn't exist until the 19th century. How did Jonathan Swift know unless he drew upon ancient tales that saw it when Mars was close enough to see with the naked eye? He even gets it right that one of Mars' satellites rotates backwards. 150 years before anybody identified it. So with that said, coming to the close of this session, Look at Revelation 6, 12 and Matthew 29 again. One says, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood. The other says, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. One says, immediately after the tribulation. The other, when he opened the sixth seal. So again, I present to you this gap. 3.5 years of peace, 3.5 years of wrath. Cosmic upheaval never one, number one, the sixth seal of revelation taking place somewhere at or during the beginning of the tribulation. The middle of the 70th week starts with the abomination of desolation. And then after, immediately after the tribulation, there is a second cosmic upheaval. The first one, the moon turns red. The second one, the moon does not give its light. Precision may better inform our eschatological timeline if we pay attention to it. That is my suggestion. I remind you, <clears throat> Matthew 24, 32 through 34 says, Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What is all these things? Well, we outline this in our fig tree generation sessions. 
But the list there is they must see the abomination of desolation. They must see the second cosmic upheaval, the signs in the heavens. And they must see the sign of the Son of Man coming. And those who see those three things, they will not pass away. And that leads us away from the belief that the generation that saw Israel's rebirth is going to see the coming of Christ to the generation that sees the abomination desolation forward will see. So real quick, let's wrap up Revelation 6. Verse 15 says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Isn't it interesting that the end of the chapter about the beginning of sorrows says his wrath has come at the end of the chapter. Isaiah 2, 10 through 11 says, Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall it be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the beautiful sloops. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low, the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And that, my friends, is where we will leave Revelation chapter 6. If during the break you want to take a look at Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, go ahead. Uh, which tribes are missing and why? We're going to look at that in the next session. And what is the role of the 144,000? Let's take a break.